Today we have a very important topic for discussion. The subject of of lecture is Swami Thirunadi Dananda. <coughs> it's a very important name for the Vedanta Society of Northern California. It's a very interesting and a very touching story of a great monk who came to this country in 1903 and passed away in 1915 and who within a very short period did so much to revitalize spiritual culture in this part of this country. <clears throat> Swami Trivunadi Dhanandaji came here to this country uh, in January 1903 and he passed away in 1915 uh, January 10th. In the course of this very short lifespan, what he did to this country, especially to this part of the United States, is something, is a story that we cannot tell without using words of exaggeration. You have to remember that there was a time when Vedanta was slowly getting popular in this country. <clears throat> if you go to our old temple in Webster Street, you find a structure which is very different from any traditional orthodox Hindu temple, where you find a large number of deities, different ceremonies, rituals, chanting of the mantras, and services performed by priests who follow certain rituals and chant some Sanskrit mantras, which an average American may not be able to understand at all. But this temple is different. In a way, it is the symbol of Vedanta, both as a philosophy and also as a way of life. Even the architectural style itself is an interpretation of Vedanta through the language of building materials. Harmony of religion, the idea that all religions are equally valid parts leading to the same goal, the idea that the highest spiritual experience is an experience that goes beyond words that is found in all religious traditions. All these are symbolized in this marvelous structure. <clears throat> Before coming to the subject, I shall just speak a few words about the great monk who built this temple who actually started a new chapter in the spiritual history of the United States. You know, when I say this, many of you may feel it's a bit of an exaggeration if we do not keep in mind the history of this country for the last 150 years. Swami Trigunadi Dhanandaji came to this country when the world was stepping into 20th century. Vedanta had not become a very well-known spiritual concept at that time. Swami Vivekananda passed away a few months before Swami Trigunadi Dhanandaji reached this country. Swamiji passed away in 1902, July 4th. And he 
came to this country in 1893. At that time, Vedanta was totally unknown. The only idea of Oriental culture was some kind of exaggerated stories of snake charmers, superstitions, and uh, all kinds of mythological make-believe uh, tales that some very enterprising evangelical Christian missionaries have brought back to this country. That was how Vedanta, or rather Hinduism, or Oriental spiritual culture was known in this country when Vivekananda arrived. He was a great speaker, he was a great dynamic spiritual teacher. So through his lectures and through his interactions, he could inspire many thinking Americans, broad-minded people, academics, and even lay devotees. And many of them became great admirers of this Vedantic ideal. But the Vedantic ideal had not gone very deep into the social mindset or the intellectual landscape of this country when Swamiji had passed away. So Vivekananda deputed one of his brother monks, Swami Turiyananda, to San Francisco. And he came and he started the Shanti Ashrama spiritual retreat where he did a great work. But uh, he went to India to see Vivekananda for some important reasons and he heard, before he reached Beluman, he heard that Vivekananda had passed away. Then he decided not to return to America. So Turiyananda ji did not return. But before that, Vivekananda had already understood some of the uh, problems that the movement was going through in this area. So he had deputed another monk, uh, Swami Trigunati Dananda, to come to this country and take up this work. So that is how he happened to come to this country. Buddhism was practically unknown in those days. Yoga, even the yo Hatha Yoga, physical part of the yoga was totally unknown. If you read Gargi's books, New Discoveries, you can see many caricatures and pictures of people living in, people assuming peculiar postures, uh, caricaturing different yogic poses. You find it in the lectures. They do not convey any, anything related to Vedanta, not even yoga. So yoga was unknown. Meditation was, meditation as a movement was unknown. Inter spirituality was unknown. Inter spiritual dialogue as a constructive, creative process of bringing together people belonging to different religions was unknown. There were many eminent thinkers, academics, enlightened uh, Christian clergymen, ministers, and intellectuals who could appreciate Vivekananda's universal outlook on religion and philosophy. But the Oriental culture itself was practically either unknown or totally and miserably misinterpreted and misrepresented and misunderstood, of course. And this Swami came to this country and within, mind you, a few months, he started his work in Old Temple in 1905, August. And the temple structure was completed in 1906, January. The cornerstone was laid in August 1905. And the dedication ceremony was held in 1906, January a matter of just a few months, the first Hindu temple and the first Vedantic spiritual, uh, spiritual place of worship was built within a matter of months. 
And less than 10 years after the rededication ceremony was over, he was killed in a bomb explosion uh, in December 27, 1914, the day on which he has given no less than three lectures on Jesus, on Christmas, the message of Jesus Christ. And that day, he was, of course, he was severely injured and passed away in January 10, in 1915. He had his friends all around the city. The staff in the firefighting station, the firemen, and some of the prominent intellectuals, very great academics, broad-minded people belonging to different traditions, the, the Christian, the Jewish traditions. They were all known his, they were all his friends and admirers who loved him. So that is a story of a very wonderful spiritual personality. So I shall just give you the little historical background. He was born in 1865. So as you can understand, he lived only for, say, 50 years. He passed away in 1915. He was born in 1865, January 30th, and passed away in January 10, 1915. And his pre-monastic name was Sharada Prasanna. There's an interesting uh, episode related to his first meeting with his great guru, Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. It seems that um, once, he, once he was a small boy studying in school, a brilliant student, he lost his gold watch and he was very much upset. And his teacher, Mahendranath Gupta, who was incidentally the chronicler of Sri Ramakrishna's teachings, the one who recorded the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, the great spiritual classic, came to know that boy was upset. And he brought him to the Ekshineshwar temple in 1884 to meet Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. There's an interesting description in this book, Swami Chaitanandaji's uh, collection of articles, life stories, God lived with them. So I should just read a, read a few lines. There is no record of what the master said to him that day. The master means Sri Ramakrishna. So, Sharada Prasanna, the pre-monastic name, of Swami Trivunadi Dhanandaji. He came to the Ekshineshwar temple where Sri Ramakrishna was living. And then there's a little, a short dialogue, a conversation with Sri Ramakrishna. But there's an entry in the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna which indicates that Sri Ramakrishna talked about some important aspects of human life. Referring to Benkim Chandra Chatterjee's famous novel Dev, Devi Choudhirani, the master said, people like the author of this book believe that knowledge is impossible without study of books. In order to know God, one must read books. But if I want to know Jadu Malik, must I first know the number of his houses and the amount of money he has in government securities? Do I really need all this information? He who seeks God plunges headlong. He doesn't calculate about how much or how little he needs for the protection of his body. So this is the beginning of Swami Thiruganadi Dhananda's interaction with Sri Ramakrishna. Benkim Chandra Chatterjee was a well-known author. 
of books. He was an intellectual, an ordinary intellectual, spiritually not so well advanced or elevated, who believed that knowledge means knowledge that you get from books. So Sri Ramakrishna's first conversation begins with that idea. There are people who believe that knowledge means information that you get from books. And he's slowly taking this boy out of that misunderstanding of what knowledge is really all about. Real knowledge, according to Sri Ramakrishna, is the knowledge of our true self, our true nature, is the knowledge of God. Sri Ramakrishna doesn't decry other types of knowledge. But elsewhere in the Gospel, he explains this further. He says, the knowledge of God is one and all other types of knowledge, physics, chemistry, philosophy, anything, history, anything. All these are so many zeros that you put on the right side of one and one is the knowledge of God. If that one is not there on the left side of the zeros, then zeros, maybe a million zeros doesn't make anything. It's only one zero. But the moment you put one to the left side of the zero, then you get a huge sum. So life itself gets fulfilled. It becomes meaningful. It becomes full only if we know the nature, if you know our true nature, if you know God. This is the first idea that his guru, his teacher, put to the disciple. He was a brilliant student. It is said that because he lost that watch, so he could not concentrate on his studies. That's the next part of the narrative which I didn't go through. So Sri Ramakrishna understood the loss of a watch made him upset and for that reason he could no possibly do well in examination. So he was upset. So Siddha Mahishana tries to take him away from that uh, mistaken notion of what knowledge is all about. So he says the highest knowledge is the knowledge of God. Siddha Mahishana used to speak and uh, mention these great spiritual truths. Whenever students, uh, earnest spiritual seekers came to visit him. Sometimes, you know, sometimes people engage in different activities, not necessarily students, who are professionals, their own duties and responsibilities. When they visit a Siddhamakshana, he will tell them, you do your duty, as maybe a businessman or a professor or a farmer, or whatever may be your job. But along with that, you also think about God. Think about higher spiritual truths. That will make your life more, more meaningful. But when young spiritual seekers who are not concerned about anything worldly, Sri Ramakrishna used to tell them straight away, about the highest spiritual truths, renunciation, and so on. Now, there is another <coughs> interesting episode. In the Gospel of Siddha Mahishna, Yam recorded Swami Trigunadi Dhananda's mental condition while he was at the Baranagar Monastery. So, we have to remember now, his teacher, his school teacher, Yam, who was the, who was a great disciple of Sri Ramakrishna, who recorded Sri Ramakrishna's teachings in the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, as the book is well known today. He was the one who took the young man, Sharada Prasanna, to his guru, to the Akshinesha, where Sri Ramakrishna was living. Sri Ramakrishna passed away <coughs> in 1886, August. After that, 
Many of these young men, about 16 of them, who were full of renunciation, who did not want to lead the life of normal householders, who wanted to live a life of total and complete renunciation, they formed a spiritual movement which later came to be known as the Ramakrishna Mission, of which Vedanta Society is just a branch. The Ramakrishna order came into existence uh, of, in the name of their guru, Sri Ramakrishna. So at the beginning of this spiritual movement, they were all living in a dilapidated building in, in the outskirts of the city of Calcutta. Very old, dilapidated building. Very difficult to live there. So there is an interesting episode from that period. The date is mentioned May the 7th, 1887. Narendra, the, 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 there is a pre-monastic name of Swami Vivekananda. Narendra was in charge of the members of the monastery and Sharada Prasanna had been practicing austere spiritual sadhana, doing spiritual practices for the past few days. Once Narendra had told him of his desire to fast to death for the realization of God. During Narendra's absence in Calcutta, Sharada Prasanna had left the monastery for an unknown destination. These young men were spending all their time in austerities, meditation, and other austere ascetic practices, reading the lives of great spiritual teachers like Buddha, Jesus, Shankaracharya, and so on. So they were hell-bent on realizing God, nothing else. So, there is an interesting episode. So, Vivekananda tells Mahindra Gupta, You see what a lot of trouble I am in. Here too, I am involved in a world of Maya. Who knows where this boy has gone? So one day, it was found, Sharada Prasanna had left the monastery without telling anybody for an unknown destination. But then there was a letter which Sharada Prasanna had written addressed to Vivekananda. I am going to Vrindavan on food. It is very risky for me to leave here. Here my mind is undergoing a change. Formerly I used to dream about my parents and other relatives. But, but Master once had told me, your people at home are apt to do anything, never trust them. So very, it needs some explanation in this context. See, Sri Ramakrishna had innumerable admirers and disciples and acquaintances. If you take a list of people who visited Sri Ramakrishna when he was leaving Dikshineshwar temple, you find great academics, great scholars, simple villagers, even atheists and anarchists and traditional, conventional believers, orthodox people, and also ultra-modern iconoclasts. All sorts of people came to Siddhamar. So, what's the kind of instruction that a spiritual teacher will give to his disciples? A spiritual teacher will adjust his instruction according to the spiritual fitness or the nature of the disciple. In fact, that's one unique characteristic of a great spiritual teacher. A great spiritual teacher will give the, a correct dose of spiritual, spirituality, neither more nor less. So, when businessmen came to Sri Ramakrishna, Sri Ramakrishna would say, you do your business, very fine, that's wonderful, look after your family, that is also very fine. But once in a while you should go to solitude. 
go to a place or a church or any place of spiritual association and spend a little time in contemplation and meditation. That will help you to balance your life as a businessman or a farmer or any ordinary secular pursuits in a proper meaningful manner. So that was the genius of a spiritual teacher. A spiritual teacher doesn't give the same code, the same size to everyone. As a tailor stitches clothes according to the according to the needs, demands of the customers. So also a great spiritual teacher like Sri Ramakrishna will interpret the same universal spiritual truth in different words and different vocabularies and put in the language of different contexts and parables. That's what you find in the, Bible, in the parables of Bible. That's what you find in the Jataka tales of Buddhist tradition. Then that's what you find in the Upanishads and other scriptures. This is one uh, unique genius of a genuine teacher. A genuine teacher won't teach the same thing. Will teach the same thing, but put in different languages, not the same language. People will misunderstand. Suppose a young man like Sharada Prasanna or Vivekananda came to Sri Ramakrishna. Now they are the type of people they want to go to Himalayas, spend the rest of their lifetime meditating in a cave. That's what they want. So, in fact, in one context you find one Christian ascetic came to Sri Ramakrishna. He was wearing a kind of the, the, the conventional robe of a clergyman, but underneath he had a cloth of this Garuva color. He wanted to show that he was a man of great renunciation. Sri Ramakrishna admired him. He was a great Christian wanderer, a mendicant, a mystic. So you find Sri Ramakrishna adjusted the teaching, his teachings, according to the needs and the spiritual fitness and the level of spiritual qualification of his disciples and admirers. So when young men, or sometimes young women, they came to Sri Ramakrishna, who were fired with total renunciation, who didn't want anything, who didn't want to lead a worldly life, who didn't want a job or money, some of them wanted to go to the Himalayas, wandering all over the sacred mountains, spending their lifetime exclusively in meditation and contemplation. Immediately, Sri Ramakrishna will talk to them about the highest spiritual experiences, the highest renunciation. Sometimes some Marwari merchants came to Sri Ramakrishna. They were running shops, big business establishments in the city of Calcutta. They still dominate the commercial life of Calcutta, mind you, their descendants. When they came to Sri Ramakrishna, when they asked him, well, what shall we do? Because they heard Sri Ramakrishna talking about the highest renunciation to some of his earnest disciples. So they were a bit disturbed and we are running business. So how can we be spiritual? Can we lead a spiritual life? Sri Ramakrishna would not give them the same teaching. Sri Ramakrishna would say, very good, you run your business, look after your children, do your duty. But once a while you go to a temple or a church or a place of worship, or maybe in your own room, sit in solitude and meditate, contemplate on the nature of God, on the meaning of life, or read some scriptures. So he had a great spiritual message for all without any discrimination. So that context should be kept in mind. So great monks like Vivekananda or Swami Trigunadidananda, they were fired with such a spirit of renunciation that suddenly they would leave, leave the monastery and start wandering in the Himalayas, in the, in the mountains of Himalayas, which are associated with Vedantic tradition for the last <clears throat> maybe 7,000 years. So that's the background. So once the Swami Trigunadidananda also left in search of 
the highest spiritual truth. You know, I am focusing on this idea for one important reason. Many of you must have seen Swami Trigunadi Dhanandaji's picture here, full suit, well-dressed, speaking English, talking about canned milk. You may have seen Vivekananda, extremely well-dressed, referring to G.S. Mill, Can, Hegel, and so on. So you may, you, some of us may not understand. Swami Vivekananda was wearing just one piece of cloth like this, not shirt, mind you. And with a long stick was wandering all over India, walking, sleeping in the mountains, in the caves, sometimes in railway stations, and also living as guests of kings and maharajas in their palaces. So, that is the other side of the picture. Many of us perhaps may not remember that part. Vivekananda was talking about Kant and Hegel was once upon a time a wanderer who moved all over India, all the way to uh, the Himalayas, Indochina border, near Indochina border, right from the southernmost tip of India. Begging food and uh, sleeping in the streets, uh, sometimes sharing food with beggars, other wanderers. So that's the other side of the picture. So that's the, why I particularly focused on this part. <clears throat> now, I'm referring to one very important part of Swami Tirunadi Dhanada's life after he came to this country. <clears throat> so as I said earlier, uh, he landed in San Francisco in uh, January 2nd, 1903. As I said earlier, that was a few months after the passing away of Swami Vivekananda. <clears throat> In 1904, some students invited Swami Tirugunadi Dhananda to start a Vedanta Center in Los Angeles, nearly 500 miles south of San Francisco. The Swami began the work day, but later found it difficult to manage both places. So he asked for an assistant from India, and they sent an assistant, his name was Swami Satchidananda, who received a hearty welcome in San Francisco and then under Swami Tirunadi Dhananda's guidance started to work in Los Angeles. But later he had to return to India for some other work. Now, we are coming to a very important phase of stage of his life and activities. In the same year, that is in 1903, say about eight months after his coming to this city, in the same year, the work in San Francisco had grown to such proportions that Swami Tirugunadi Dhananda felt the society should have a suitable building of its own. With Swami Tirugunadi Dhananda, to think was to act, and a committee was at once appointed to look for a suitable site. Now, some, there were a few glimpses of Swami Tigunadi Dhananda's dynamism and energy that appeared in the later articles which were published in our journals in India. He was not a specialist in management science. He was a monk who led a very ascetic life, who read scriptures, Sanskrit scriptures, and who practically uh, was not professionally trained in uh, building structures, building temples or anything. Why and how could he add with so much of energy, so much of efficiency? The reason was he considered himself to be an effective instrument in the hands of his teacher, the Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, his teacher and his leader, Swami Vivekananda. So the strong conviction that his spiritual ideal was leading him throughout his life 
gave him so much of conviction, so much of strength, and so much of energy that he could accomplish so much within a very short time. That full conviction that God was behind him and God was before him. Supporting him from behind and leading him from the front. That's how the article concludes elsewhere. So that's why he said, no, with Swami Trigunadi Dananda, to think was to act. And the committee was immediately appointed to look for a suitable site. Soon a meeting of all the members was called. The funds were quickly raised and a plot of land was purchased on the corner of Webster and Filbert Streets on 25th August 1905. With the appropriate ceremonies, the cornerstone was laid. We recently recovered the cornerstone and we are going to rededicate it, reinstall it later when the temple, at one stage of the uh, construction of the temple. On 25th August in 1905, with the appropriate ceremonies, the cornerstone was laid. The Swami placed in, in it the pictures of Sri Ramakrishna, Holy Mother, and others within a metal box. Regarding the future of the temple, Swami Trigunati Dhananda said, I shall not live to enjoy. Others will come later who will enjoy. And referring to his own participation, he boldly proclaimed, Believe me, if there is the least tinge of selfishness in building this temple, it will fall. But if it is the master's work, it will stand. Now, this, this was one of the few structures that withstood the impact of the terrible earthquake and fire of 1906. So practically, they say it did not have a foundation, but it had a very strong foundation. The foundation was made of not bricks or granite, but unselfishness. That's what Swami Dhirunadi Ranji himself writes. If there is the least selfishness in building this temple, it will fall. But if it is the master's work, it will stand. As I said, it withstood the impact of the earthquake and fire in 1906. As I said, one of the rare buildings that withstood that catastrophe. And we discovered later that it did not have a regular foundation. But now we understand, when we read these lines, we understand it had a very strong foundation, unshakable foundation. And that's what Jesus said, you know, you build your home on a rock, it will stand. Build on sand, it will fall. So you can find the identical images from different scriptures. It's amazing that this terrible earthquake and fire, we destroyed so much of San Francisco, did no damage the temple. This was the first Hindu temple in the Western world. It was dedicated on 7th January 1906, and the first services were held there on Sunday, 15th January 1906. So I remember, the cornerstone was laid, the building proper started in 1905, August 25th, and the dedication ceremony in 7th January 1906. So just a matter of May, maybe yeah, for just less than five months. Now, it is said about this temple that he had planned this temple himself and he combined ideas of Hindu temple, Christian church, Muslim mosque, uh, and uh, an average normal American residence. And sometimes, you know, it was designed by the architect Joseph A. Leonard in a style generally called pointed architecture of Grecian Roman origin. All the moldings, ornaments, and the arches of Vedanta are of Moorish style. The points of dooms, towers, pinnacles directed upward the sky have a religious meaning moving towards God or rising higher and higher until will reach the very highest. Now, <clears throat> he was not only a great builder, but he was also a great teacher and a great trainer. There are so many stories about the way he trained his disciples, the way he um, uh, made them assimilate 
the fundamental teachings of Vedanta. We already mentioned earlier, you know, there was an uh, interesting work done under the guidance of Swami Thiriyananda just before the arrival of Swami Thirunadidananda. Um, the beginning of uh, the Shanti Asrama, there's an important work associated with uh, Swami Vivekananda. Somebody gave a donation of, I maybe mean, a contribution of a stretch of land to Swami Vivekananda, and he instructed through Swami Thirunadi Dhananda's predecessor, Swami Thiri Ananda, to start a retreat center that's now known as Shanti Ashram. So, Swami Thirunadi Dhananda continued the work of teaching and training disciples in Shanti Ashram. Here is an interesting eyewitness account left by Swami Atulananda. Swami Atulananda was an initiated disciple of Swami Adbhut, sorry, Swami Abhedananda. But he was trained by Swami Thiriyananda and later under Swami Thirunathidananda. He has written a very well-known book, Atman Alone Abides. There, there is an eyewitness account left by Swami Atulananda. He was born in Holland, but came to this country, became a monk, later returned to India and passed away there. He was highly venerated, self-realized monk of those days. So here is a description of the type of training that Swami Trugunadidananda used to give to his disciples. Swami Trugunadida was a man of austere type. When he first came to San Francisco, he fasted once for three days, maybe to accumulate the power to carry on the work. He was a strict disciplinarian. Once on Sri Ramakrishna's birthday, he spent 15 hours in worship from 6 a.m. in the morning to 9 p.m. in the evening and delivered three lectures, all without leaving the platform. He was a very jolly type of man and very active. He encouraged others also to follow a tight routine, meditation, study, work, and so on. At lectures, there would be no chase on the platform, yet only a desk and when speaking, he used to lean on it. He ran a bookstore and he himself kept the accounts. One day he found the account five dollars short. He was worried and for days together he worked trying to make the account balance. Then at long last he wrote at the bottom of the page, five dollars short, however let it go. Sometimes, you know, when we look back, we may wonder why a Swami should worry so much about five dollars. If you look at the lives of many great monks of this tradition, we find they were worried because they felt that the money didn't belong to them. That's why that's what made them worry. Normally, we don't worry when we feel that it doesn't belong to us. We worry only when we feel it belongs to us. But in the, in, in the case of Swami Trunadi Dananda, he felt that everything belongs to Sri Ramakrishna. Everything belongs to God. Comes from God and so it should go back to God. So he had no right to be indifferent or negligent. That was what made him worry. So frequently in worldly life, this is an interesting juxtaposition. In our life, when we worry about money, that worry takes us away from God. That worry about money and wealth takes us away from God. But in the case of a great monk like this, the worry reminds him of God. Because he's worried about money because he thought he knew that money belonged to God. So that's the main difference. I can give the example of a monk who passed away maybe about 20 years back. My, I was very familiar with him. There was a monk who was involved in constructing a very 
important uh, temple of uh, Vedanta tradition in the Ramakrishna order in India. So he was very particular when the work was going on. So you feel that this man is talking like a big contractor or a, even a contractor won't get angry like this. He used to inspect the building materials and he used to watch the way the bricks were laid, you know. So in, maybe in Indian setting, you know, so much of superstition was necessary, perhaps, you know. <laughs> Close supervision necessary. So, and he saw to it that every work was done so perfectly. So people thought he's a monk uh, and he's worried so much about the way the work was going on. Apparently not a spiritual work, you know, brick, brick work, you know, flooring work, ceiling and so on. But eventually when he reached his 92nd year, he retired. And then he was not worried at all. And then he, he, will, he was completely immersed in the thought of God in meditation, in spiritual practices. So a person who was so much engaged, involved in so many activities, which were apparently not spiritual activities. Now, if somebody is seen sitting in meditation, we can understand he is communicating with God or prayer perhaps. But he was supervising the construction of a temple, a building, and inspecting the quality of building materials, and sometimes quarreling with the contractors, inspecting everything with minute attention. So people thought, well, he is a monk after all, but he is so much bothered about these things. They, were, didn't, they began to have some reservations about him. But then what happened when he reached the 92nd year, he was completely retired from everything. He withdrew himself from all these supervis supervision, other activities. He completely uh, withdrew himself from all this and spent his time exclusively in spiritual practices, meditation, prayer, and so on. Nothing else. And he passed away and he was almost 98 years old, after six years. But they got a clue as to why he could withdraw so completely from activities when he was retired. The reason was they found a japamala, a beast in his pocket. So whenever he went about, went round, supervising the construction of the temple, his right hand will be within his pocket, shirt pocket. So there was Japamala. Japamala, as you know, the, be the beads that he used for doing spiritual practice. It was, his hand was busy with that Japamala, the beads. And he was shouting with the contractor, maybe the workers, to see that the work is done properly. So he was practicing karma yoga. Karma plus yoga, mind if you. If you are practicing only karma, action, then he won't be able to retire from work when he was retired. When he retired from active responsibility, his mind straight went to God. Before that, he was doing every work, not as work, but work as yoga. So when karma was gone, yoga was left behind. It's a great lesson for all people. Now, if you read the life of Swami Trugunadidananda, you find he was a strict disciplinary. And he enforced his discipline among his disciples and others. He taught them. With all the sternness, all the rigidity, had a spiritual coating about it. That's what... Uh, this, this, I mean, differentiates spiritual personalities from others. As I said, when the, the great Swami was engaged in work, he was so much engaged in work apparently, but actually for him every work, the work of God. That's why his right hand was busy with the Japamala, and he was busy supervising the construction. That's why Swami Trunadi Dananda, you find here, he could, uh, he could uh, find so much of energy, enthusiasm, and efficiency, and could accomplish within months 
what many people may have taken years, and that too he did not have money even. There are many stories associated with that. He borrowed money from some rich person's devotees, and he was in difficulty. He was facing a great risk, and maybe he, the temple property may have to be sold to pay back the debt. But on one fine day morning, he had, was praying to Sri Ramakrishna the previous night. Next day morning, an old man comes, assisted by a youngster, and with a big, thick bag full of six thousand dollar in gold, and that saved the old temple and its future. So all these, what we call miracles, are associated with this great monk who came here. Miracles are nothing but the intervention of God. When we cannot relate things within our own, we cannot analyze and understand within our own uh, intellectual realm. We call it miracle. Miracle is purely a scientific phenomenon. When we transcend the physical, the empirical, the relative, the worldly levels, then things happen due to what we normally call divine intervention, and that's called miracle. So his whole life was in this respect, kind of a miracle. So that's the story. He was worried about five dollars, and that worry was. Rooted in his strong conviction that those five dollars belong to God, so it should be properly accounted for. It was that worry instead of taking him away from God, took him closer to God. So when worry can be given a spiritual orientation. So Swami Trunadi Dhananda Ji also started a convent as a separate community at the earnest entreaty of some women disciples who wanted to leave the life of. Discipline under his guidance, and so on. Another very interesting thing, as I said earlier, on Sunday afternoon, twenty seventh December, nineteen fourteen, he was lecturing in the old temple when a young man, a former student of Swami Trunadi Dhananda, his name was Louis Vavra. He <coughs> came forward to the podium and exploded a bomb which is a tremendous explosion and uh, you know what swami trunadi dananda did on his way to the hospital after being severely injured he said where is louis the poor fellow he was killed in fact that in that explosion that's what really happened so when he was being taken to the hospital with the assistance of the firemen who lived close by there was a fire station Close to the old temple at that time, he was not inquiring about his health condition. He was inquiring about the poor man. He knew the young man coming forward. He was somewhat physically, mentally handicapped. He was mentally challenged. He was insane. He used to come to the monastery and he used to go out. So Swami Trunadi Dhananda used to advise him, "Please go to some countryside and get a useful job that will keep you engaged. That will be helpful to him because he, had, he was slowly." Driving him to the insane insanity, so the Swami used to advise him, but he didn't listen. He didn't do any work. So he knew this man was behind because he had seen him coming forward, and he was fully conscious when he was being taken to the hospital. So he made in this inquiry, "Where is Louis, poor fellow?" That was his inquiry. So he still was filled with pity for his mentally. Ill student and disciple, <clears throat> and then there is another statement. The one nurse who was uh, treating, who was involved in treating Swami Trunadi Dhananda, nursing him, said, "I have never seen such a calm, uncomplaining, and enduring patient in my life." So words uttered by a nurse who was nursing the Swami as he was uh, lying severely injured in the hospital bed. And uh, at 7:30 p.m. on 10th January 1915, he passed away. The story. So one year later, on 13 April 1916, Swami Prakash Ananda, who was for some time Swami Thunadi Ananda Ji's assistant here, carried the Swami's relics to Shanti Ashram and installed them on the top of the highest hill, Siddhagiri, the hill of realization. 
so this is a story of a great spiritual teacher a classic example of spirituality and selfishness service total dedication thank you namaskar <coughs> om shanti 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 hari om tat sat sri ramakrishna namaste